Good afternoon, my name is Chris Lindsay. I, here's my background, have been in software development for over 35 years. Believe it or not, I'm actually over 50. A lot of people think I'm under. I've been in security software uh, or secure coding for easily 15 years. I put 15, but really it's more like 25. I ran an application security program for a very large company for three. And so a lot of the challenges companies and people have facing, what am I looking at? Is this actual? Is this not? Am I going to send my developers on a goose chase? Yes or no? What do I want to do? I'll have a, uh, at the end, I have a LinkedIn thing again. I do a lot of posting on LinkedIn three times a week where I talk about application security things, issues that I'm seeing. I talk about it, but I also give a pain point and a solution. I do both. That way I'm not posting crap for people to consume. So today we're gonna to talk about, I'm gonna start off with an introduction. We're gonna talk about risks. We're gonna talk about the pitfalls in risk assessment. We're gonna talk about strategies for effective risk uh, management because that's the biggest one. We'll wrap up and then Q and A's if we have time. So updating your dependencies is like going to the dentist. If you don't do it often, it's gonna hurt. I usually start with a joke. My, uh, the joke I was actually kind of half thinking about was, uh, bear with me, this is a good uh, action. So knock, knock. Vulnerability. I already got gotcha. you. Ah, All right. So let's talk about defining dependency risks. So dependency risks go far beyond licensing they go beyond compatibility, GPL. Some of us are a little bit older in the room, some of us aren't. Who remembers from the 90s Linksys, the WGRT routers? Couple hands. So for us who remember it, essentially the developer created his own open source utility. He put it out there, Linksys used it. They did not follow the appropriate licensing, and as a result of that, we actually got a copy of their source code and the ability to upload it. So it was the, one of the best gifts that open source, but that introduced the risk of licensing. So we have to think about licensing when we do our, when we're looking at open source within our environment. We have to look at the copy left. We have to look at what are the requirements. Can we run it? safely or are we going to turn it into another Linksys example? So that's out there. You have compliance. You got to make sure that you're, you know, completing the PCI DSS compliance, not skipping it. If you skip it and you get caught, that's not good. As well as rush to release. And one of the, uh, the biggest risks there is if you're rushing to release, what are you going to release? Actually, I'm going to hit stories on here because I think I've got plenty of time. So I was on a panel about a year and a half ago up in Michigan, and we were talking about, the question became, uh, came from a CISO. We had about 40 in the room, and they were all CISOs, and they had asked the panel, can we bypass the pipeline for security? Because if we have a problem, I don't want the pipeline to run the extra 45 minutes, two hours, whatever's required to get through it. And the three guys in front of me said, no, you absolutely have to go through the pipeline. You can't bypass it. Me? Absolutely can bypass it. However, caveat, when you upload it to the repo, you got to kick off your scan. Kick it off manually. That way it can run in parallel. So once you get through the build, get through to QA, and get ready for release, now you have your results. Now you know, am I safe to go or not? I can bypass that 45-minute delay because I can run it in parallel. So when you're going through and you're doing pushes and releases, you know, think about the high levels of what you might run into because that's absolutely important. So dependency risk also goes beyond, think about your supply chain risks. Think about your third-party libraries. With third-party libraries, think about your tertiary. So you've got a dependency of a dependency of a dependency of a dependency. That's absolutely crucial and should not be overlooked. And the reason for that is because, well, there's plenty of examples. Spring for hell, log4j, just two to name. Think about your insider threats. Your XE is the current example with the open source. Now, I will say it's great that we caught it. 
the crazy part was it was Microsoft who caught it, of all people, <laughs> which hats off to them. The fact that the Microsoft guy saw something, this is weird, this is a little strange, let me dig into it. So the fact that he stood up and actually did something about it was, was amazing. And so we still have these kind of risks. And we also have AI automation and ethical hacking tools. One of the things that I've talked about at our VIP dinners that I do from time to time, I get in front of a lot of CISOs, and a common question that I ask, with the advancements of technology, and this was actually before AI, by the way, with the advancements of technology and with the tooling that's out there, are you ready for the uncertain, the, the future of what's coming? Because if you have no plans whatsoever, you're going to get caught with your pants down, and you're going to find yourself in a bad spot. With AI automation, there are new AI ethical hacking tools. What defines ethical? That's up to you, because you're the users. They're out there. They're easy to use. Those are risks. And they are, to put it mildly, very brutal, because they will sit there and punch in and punch in and punch in until they can get in. And there's a lot of LLMs. You go to Hugging Face, there's 550,000 models that you can download today. Today. They are increasing every day. And not all these models are legal and happy. Zero day vulnerabilities. So the question, you know, when you type, look at your types of risks, zero vulnerability, zero day vulnerabilities. Are you ready? So right now, if something were to happen in your environment, what are the steps that you need to take to actually know, does this affect me? Because if you can't say within a very short period of time, you're not prepared. You need to be absolutely prepared. I was there for Log4j, Spring for Shell, even Citrix, multiples. And we had, to give you it mildly, we we're scanning right around the ballpark of 2.9 billion lines of code a month. We had projects all over the place. We had Java, we had .NET, we had C and C++ and all the stuff in between, Golang. We knew within 20 minutes our entire touch base across the entire environment. From there, <laughs> we were actually able to talk to the teams. I call it pulling the fire alarm. Pulling the fire alarm is I'm going to bring everybody together, all the architects, into a call. We had over 700 plus developers, pulled the fire alarm, got everybody together, said, hey, anybody that's on this list, you need to stay. If you're not, but you have a program that we're not aware of, just at least be aware. We talked about it, and within 12 hours across the entire enterprise, we were mitigated or updated the open source to resolve it. That's planning. That's making sure you're ready for zero day. Talk about your code quality, your performance, and your bugs, and your dependency. That's a type of risk. Your developers are your biggest risk. Because if I'm writing an API endpoint that's a multi-tenant, raise the hands. Who knows multi-tenant? OK, for those who don't, think of your bank website. I log into the bank. You log into the bank. We have different accounts, different information. If I'm hitting the API endpoint, and I'm plugging in your information, with my credentials, I should not get it. If or however, you type in, you know, you, my, you know, I log in, type in your credentials and it gets blocked, then that's taken care of. So your developers are also part of your code quality, performance, and bugs. And your dependencies also have them. The vulnerabilities and dependencies, you have, I, I kind of mentioned it before, the tertiary, so a dependency of a dependency of a dependency. So when you start looking at log4j, I'm going to just go back to that because I lived it. And it was, it, was, it was smooth for me because I still have friends today that are still living the nightmare, which is crazy to think. But it was just because they're so big. And so you might look at an application like, well, I'll use one that was exposed, Minecraft, right? You know, the chat portion of Minecraft. You can go in there and just type it. Now, that wasn't a direct dependency. That was an indirect dependency that they were doing for the logging. And that was, you know, that's a good example of a risk that's there. Yeah, malicious intent and packages. Key difference between vulnerabilities and malicious intent. 
Vulnerabilities is a developer who doesn't know what they're doing securely, and they're doing SQL injection without realizing it. They're concatenating strings. They're going in and doing things without realizing, hey, I should encode this to protect myself from cross-site script injection. A malicious intent is I am going to go focus in, like XE, and create a backdoor. I am doing something malicious and purposeful. So that's another type of risk that's out there. And of course, data loss, right? Who knows of a company that has been absolutely safe through data loss? Gee, I don't know. Let me see. Microsoft, let's see, recently passwords. Um, we look at just about every company that, the main companies you know that are targets, and probably easily half of them have sent me a notice in the last five years. Your information has been compromised, including social security number and phone number and date of birth and you know your mother's maiden name and all that great stuff. So again, you know, you've got all these risks that are just hitting you all at the same time, right? And the question really becomes, you know, what do we do? And, and we're getting there. We have technical debt and challenges. So think about what do I need to do to keep my system maintained? What do I need to do to stay on top? It, it's, it, it's hard, right? Because you, you have this force against development that says, we need to get this out the door. Then the other side of the force, you have security pushing back saying, but it's got to be secure. You got to find a balance. And typically what happens is when you're writing software, which I did for a very long time, typically you take shortcuts. We'll get it later. We'll do this later. We'll do this later. Later never happens. And proof of concepts always become production code. Environmental factors. So you have a commu uh, committer that lives in a country at war. At the time that I switched over from running my program over to the vendor that I'm at, we had several teams in Ukraine. And when the war started with Russia, that greatly impacted us. The guys had to stop and we had to disconnect and they would occasionally pop on and do their thing. But I mean, you have a lot of environmental factors, time constraints. And when you're looking at open source maintainers, it's not their day job. A lot of maintainers, it's in their evening. It's a passion. It's a love. So again, that's a risk that happens to you. So the uh, challenges and pitfalls. So the common challenges faced in the environments. I was just talking to a very large company that's got, I want to say, I don't remember the number, but it was like 200,000 developers. They were talking about their silos, the problem that they're having with security and their silos. And one of the things that I did, I took an API best practice document from a development coding best practice. Here's how we do it for our given team. If you run a development team, that's what you do, right? You create a document. Anybody brand new, as even open source, hey, you're going to submit and, and be a committer to our, our open source application. Here are the guidelines on how we want it to look. That way, anybody can follow behind. It's good. It's clean. It's common. I can go from here to here and still read the code. But the problem becomes when, when, when you have that, that's not enough. So you take security and you take the development, you put it together. I took software architects across our entire company, brought 20 of the most known guys from big to small applications and said, hey, let's build a document together. Let's break the barriers. We got to know each other. We worked together and we were able to put together a document of 85 pages that went all the way down to, I'm hitting an API. I failed my authentication. What does that look like? What's my error code? All the way down to there. And that helps. When you're going through and you're actually taking your risk assessments, what are you going to do? Oh, CVSS 3 or 3.1. We're going to just do these basics. The problem with that is you're not actually looking at the root problem. Because the root problem, I have a command injection, but it's on a website. That's bad. That's very, very bad. I have a command injection on a command line prompt application, a console app. Guess what? You're already on the box. Doesn't matter. So you have the problems of CFESS scoring. And you got to consider your key risks or your key factors that determine. You can't just throw crap over the wall to your developers and say, hey, guess what? I have something. Go, go to town. Your developers are going to flip you a bird and say, go away, because it doesn't matter. 
So that's also one of the reasons why I talk frequently about you need a developer on the security team because they can look at it, they can identify that this doesn't matter, and they can go ahead and say, hey, so now all of a sudden you're not going back to the development going, hey, the sky's falling, you got a problem. They can go back and say, hey, you know what? Here's a list of our findings. These three matter, the rest are good preferential. Now you're actually working with your developers and you're building a better relationship. And so when you're looking at the challenges, you may have millions of lines of code and you have a lot on your plate that you've got to go through and dig through. And trying to get through it in a reasonable amount of time, tools are great for help pointing the stuff out, but you still need the human element to understand and weed out the garbage from the important stuff. So I'm going to talk about seven strategies to fix this for risk management. So go big picture. What does the threat landscape look like? Don't look at the trees. Too many people get so focused on the trees, it just you don't see the forest. You need to focus on your big picture. Your very large companies, your IBMs, your Capital Ones, your extremely large companies, they focus on the forest. And then they sift it down all the way down to the developer. Start big, think big, and work down. Prioritization. Pick off the low-hanging fruit, right? What's the easiest thing that you can pick off? Dependencies. Update your dependencies. I can tell you, and I don't know which slide it's on. It's, it's kind of a funny one. Um, I'll get there. It's another humor thing. But the reality is, is dependencies are a potential. It's a big risk if you're taking it. Let me, let me ask you a question. Show of hands. When you download an executable, do you run it through an antivirus scanner? Nobody runs antivirus on a download. Man, OK, OK, OK. <laughs> so when you're downloading open source, do you do the same? Do you run it through a scanner? Well, there's not really one out there. But when you download open source, you're just taking it, and you're just plugging it in. And, and you know, the downside of that is you have a trust factor. And making sure that you're keeping the trust and you're, you know, do code reviews. I'm just going to put that out there. If you can, look at the open source and do a little bit of a code review on it. But the easiest thing to pick off low-hanging fruit is dependencies. Because if you have an application with 4,000, which I've seen before in the wild, SQL injections, you might as well rewrite the whole thing at that point because it was an old ASP application. So, but your dependencies are the easiest hits. Think about the worst thing that could happen and then plan for that because a lot of companies and a lot of people don't think about that. What's the worst thing that could happen to your application? Data loss, that's going to be bad, but not detrimental, could be. But if I could get through your application, on the other hand, that's a different story. Fun story happened because I did some fun pen testing. Show of hands, who remembers JavaScript eval method? OK, a couple. With eval, the, the application I was looking at had eval to go figure out what time zone the person was logging in from. If I logged in from Pacific time, it would say 5 o'clock. If I logged in on Eastern time, it would do the calculations and still say 5 o'clock, even though the database had a different time. But they were using eval. I was able to log in. I was able to run PowerShell unauthenticated. And when I did the ping from there, it came to my server with their server IP address, not me. So now I knew I had the keys to the kingdom. So think about the worst thing that could happen. With something like that, I could download a malware, ransomware, or anything, and then kick it off. So think about what is the worst thing that can happen, and then start coming in from there. Build a plan, execute, and stick to the plan. Too many people build playbooks. They don't know how to build proper playbooks. They build their playbooks. Hey, in the event that this happens, here's what we need to do. But the problem is, is the playbook sits in a repository or somebody's desktop. And then when the time comes, nobody knows where to find it or how to get to it. So make sure you have that. Move from reactive to proactive. Remove your silos. Too many companies are reactive. Too many companies are in a position where they are always fighting fires. And the problem is, and I talk about this frequently, I do a lot of stuff on LinkedIn, and I actually had a little video about it. But you can lose ground even though you're trying to gain ground. And what happens is if you have developers who are not educated in secure practices, they're going to be continuing to put 
secure vulnerabil or vulnerabilities into your system while you're trying to track down and clean them up. Work from the top down. Make sure the developers understand secure clean coding. That will move you towards more of a proactive approach. Set realistic goals. 90%, I had a guy come to me and say, I aim for 100%. I said, great. 90% is easy. You can hit 90% in how big is your application? 2 million lines of code. Great, you can hit 90% in, let's say, six months. Are you going to spend another six months working on the last 10%, or are you going to work on other applications and get those to 90%? The 100% is never going to be hit because lows, informationals, some mediums, the mediums, I always told my developers, this could be code quality or this could be a vulnerability. Go look at it, make sure that you're good. So aim for your 90%, 100% is just not attainable. Quarter over quarter reduction, what I did company-wide, I had all the teams go for 20% reduction quarter over quarter if they could. Depending on the size of the application, I had tiers. And that tier would say 20%, 15%, 10%, 5%, and hopefully at least something. Because I had a 12 million line application and trying to hit 20% in one quarter is absolutely unattainable. So you have to plan accordingly, but put something in the place. Because if you can and you have a small app, if you have 100 vulnerabilities, no reason why they can't be done in six months or less. So come up with a plan, go after the plan, and absolutely, absolutely, absolutely internal pen testing. Because with pen testing, I found typically 10 findings per one hired out company that would do it. Now, granted, we had source code, so we had gray box testing. I understood what the vulnerabilities were. I gave the printouts of all the SAS results to the pen tester and said, here you go, have fun. You know what's out there, see what you can find. Record, record, record you attacking. Because if you record the attack, now you can give it to the developers and the developers can go in and say, this is how he did it. Here's the fix. Is it still vulnerable? If you don't have the video, they're not going to know how to go reproduce it. You can say step by step. Visualize is a lot better. Implement automated workflows. You know what? You're never going to hit a good program unless you're doing automation. Without automation, you might as well just good luck, because you cannot scale yourself to hit an entire company. Therefore, focus on automation. Work at your pipeline, your automation for SEM. I have an SEM tool, I commit code, it kicks it off. I go do a build, it goes through the build, I get the results. Do not block your developers and do not, whatever you do, block a branch based on a vulnerability. Because too many times people go in, hey, guess what, Chris, I did a branch protection rule, I'm great. I said, great, what did you do? Well, I said criticals and highs. Great, what's a high? Seven and above? Absolutely. So you have this finding here, Jackson Data Bind. We all know that one's a good one, right? So Jackson Data Bind has several nines. So he went in and he, he got a better version. And now he went from a 9.8 to a 7.2. Great, you're better. You can't release because your branch protection rules break you. Licensing, absolutely break on licensing because you do not want GPLs in production or copylefts. Your immediate actions to mitigate, block the commits if you can, that fail your security test. Come up with your plan, put that in there. If you don't block it, at least notify. Notify somebody, the team itself. I did it dirty. Every time you committed code, I ran my scans, I had all the information, and I sent an email to the committer's email address. And I had developers say, why am I getting emails on my personal Gmail account? And I said, why are you committing code with your personal Gmail account for work? <laughs> so, you know, that, that's dirty. But on the other hand, oh, and once a month, I would send an email to the whole team of what the stats look like from everybody. So everybody knew everybody on there. Uh, teach and educate your developers. So make sure that you're teaching your developers how to write secure code. Because if they're not writing secure code, why are we here? right? Because your developers are going to continue to write SQL injection because they think it's right. Make sure that they're doing parameterized SQL. Make sure they're doing it right. You can even do inline. And kind of summarizing, develop a tailored risk mitigation plan to your environment. Every environment is different. 
focus on the worst potential event that may happen. Consider the environmental factors that you're having to deal with, internal sites, external sites, because that really does make a big difference. Or if you're doing open source, make sure that your open source is not going to affect other people's open source. Play nice. Prioritization, you know, fix, look at the, the things. Think of the worst application in the worst environment. I have something in web that has vulnerabilities that could be reached on the back end from the front end. If you're doing an API and a UI says this can be 15 characters and I override it with 16, you better throw that whole payload out, you better log it, and you better do something about it. At least have it there so that you can go back. Because if you have a payload that does not meet your validation criteria, kick it out because somebody did something they shouldn't have. And that is a sign. One of the things I always had my teams do is log the IP address it came from. And if they were, you know, even the whole payload, take the sensitive piece of the payload, if you know it's sensitive, encrypt it, put it in the database. That way, if the database is compromised, you don't have all the information, but you can take that information, decrypt it, and get it. Make sure that you're looking at the, the right tools and technologies for looking at the risk assessment and mitigation. SAS is not the golden bullet. SCA is not a golden bullet. DAST is not a golden bullet. They all work together to form a good system, and that information that comes from them is helpful for determining what the next steps are. I had a very close friend of mine that runs a very large company, a very large enterprise, tell me there's no such thing as a false positive. And I looked at him, we were on a Zoom call, and I said, how is that possible? When I ran my program, I had hundreds and hundreds. He goes, what, what, what's the tool supposed to do, right? Find things. It found things. It found things that it was programmed to find. Is that a false positive? No, it's a true positive. But in its context, it's a false positive to what your needs are. That was mind-blowing for me because I always was like, I hate false positives. But when he said that, can't argue with that logic. That's hard to to go against. So make sure you're doing the right tools and technologies for automating risks and uh, mitigation processes. Security is a journey. It does take time to get there. There will be bumps in the road. You'll have your developers fight back. You'll have your security team fight back. Focus on security champions. That has been something that I, I know it's, it's an in thing. It's an out thing. Some companies love it. Some companies hate it. I actually paid my security champions two to $5,000 each more in salary when I promoted them up to security champions. I had my director say they would never do that. They were happy, absolutely happy to get the, the money. They were also happy to get the promotion and they were very excited about it. And the reality is if they're happy, then everybody's happy. But the cost of the security that they were providing, I could not pay one FTE, which was the equivalent of what I paid for all this, to do what they did. When you look at it in that angle, that pays dividends, absolutely dividends. So it's a journey. Questions? Oh, and, and the piece that I was looking for that I don't know where it was, there it is, missed it. Manual processes will result in manual results, or yeah, results, said every developer opening Excel, because we all know that's where everything lives. I don't know how many more minutes we have, but any questions? Good, bad, like it, love it, hate it. So I do, good, thumbs up. I do a lot of posting on LinkedIn. It is not my company. It's my profile. It's what I do. I post three times a week. My biggest thing is just education. I do a lot of mentorship. If you guys need somebody to come in and speak to your developers or to your security teams, I do it for free. I enjoy what I do and I love sharing. And if you guys are running a program yourself and you are the guy running the program, find me for two reasons. I actually have a private community of tech leaders at very large enterprises that it's, it's a private one. But if you're running a program, we'll talk. If you're fit for it, we'll let you in. The other thing, too, is I do podcasts. I'm kicking off a podcast. It's theme based. It's not an interview style. It's not, hey, Chris. So what did you do last weekend? Blah, 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 worthless, waste of time. It is theme-based. Hey, guess what? It's day zero. You're the guy that's the CISO, or you're the one that's been running the program. 
you're starting at a brand new job, it's day one, where do you start? What does that look like? And I've talked to top tech guys that are in that environment doing that kind of stuff. And the amount of value information that comes from it is critical because they talk about learning the executive chain, knowing who the key stake players are, knowing what tools are being done. What's my inventory? What technologies are under the stack? What tools are being used? What does my develop our security team look like? All the way down. And so now it's a whole different holistic approach to it all. It's broken down into half an hour. Unfortunately, the first recording was an hour and a half. So we had to do some chopping in the second one as well, but that's coming out. So with that being said, guys, thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate you guys coming here. I hope you enjoyed today's speech.